What's up, YouTube? So, the focus of my project is about how the artist as an individual, their identity sort of is very apparent in their work, not just their artistic skill, but all the different parts of their lives and who they are as a person. And um, the artist that I was going to choose to focus on is Hilma Af Klint. It seems kind of cliche because she's very well known and very popular right now, but I really wanted to do more of a deep dive study into who she was and focus a lot on her you know, her life and gather a lot of biographical information to sort of almost not even just analyze her work, but sort of analyze her personality and to see how um, her life experiences and all the different things she was interested in outside of just visual art and painting influenced her work and how we can see those within her work um, from her upbringing up until um, her death and the things that she did and accumulated in her lifetime. So just for some really quick background, uh, she was born in Sweden to Protestant parents. Her, She grew up in a naval family, so assumed very diligent, strict. She was the fourth out of five children. And so her family uh, lived in Sweden. She spent summers on an island off the coast of Sweden with her family. And so just from, oh, and her parents were both mathematicians. Her father was a mathematician who also taught classes. Um, and... So just from those two things, we can understand that through her work, a lot of the diagrams and the geometry included in her work, as well as a lot of the references to nature and evolution, um, can be seen possibly, you know, coming out of those experiences in her childhood, um, growing up in a family like that with both uh, mathematics and growing up in the church, and also her parents being probably militant, her father being a Navy admiral, and... Spending summers on an island with a focus on nature lends it to her interest when she was at the Royal Art Academy in botanical illustration, and in a lot of her abstract work, some of the few references to representational forms are birds and plant forms, and a lot of the bodies are very anatomical, but painted very express expressionistically. So, and this is why I think it's important not to just see her as an abstract painter, and just like all artists, I think it's always really important to focus on um, their entire identity and not just see them as just an artist, but as a full complex person where all these experiences feed into their work. And so I'm personally very interested in Hilma Afklin, especially because I'm very interested in the metaphysical. Um, I really like astrology and I really like sort of understanding like the alchemy of all things and how everything is connected. So um, I definitely looked... because her birth was documented because her father was in the Navy, her birth time and everything was very documented. So I did look at her astrological chart and because I understand astrology, I've been analyzing her chart to better understand her as a person. She was a Scorpio, um, which I think, again, being very interested in the occult and wanting to go beyond what's visible to the eye and understand things and be able to, you know, quote unquote, see things that many people can't see or, you know, in, intuitively access, she was able to do that because of um, who she was and because she was unafraid to do that. And at this time in Sweden, it's, um, there's a big theosophical movement, philosophy is huge, there's a lot of conferences and talks being given in the capital or in Stockholm and in Copenhagen, and she's attending these um, as she is a, after she moves out of her house and she's a young adult. She's living in Stockholm, and she's attending the Royal Arts Academy, which is a big deal because at this time, places like Germany and France were not even allowing women to attend art school. And so she's attending the Royal Art Academy in Stockholm. She has five years of classical art training. She's painting a lot of landscapes and portraits, and she's able to sell these pieces and make her living off of this. So she's financially independent from a young age, and she's able to before she starts painting anything abstractly, really, she's making this work and she's um, making a living off of it. And so many people see her as a very talented um, landscape painter and portrait artist. And she has a studio above a gallery in Stockholm where she's showing this work and selling it. Um, but behind closed doors, she sort of secretly has this occult life and where she begins doing a lot of unconscious work. So... Um, her and four other women, they call themselves the Five. They are doing seances every week, beginning in 1896, and they're very interested in contacting the spirit realm and getting in touch with their own unconscious, and they're doing stream of consciousness writing and drawings and 
they're doing drawings together, and um, out of the four of them, in 1904, they're all contacted by these, you know, quote-unquote higher powers who want to um, sort of utilize them to convey these messages to people, and they specifically, you know, they want these women to do this, and the other four are kind of afraid, and, but Hilma F. Clinton wants to take on this task, and so she, by herself, enters this journey of beginning to let, be able to open herself up enough to allow these other energies to sort of enter her body and then convey these messages through her. So it's almost like, to me, she's like a philosopher and also a visionary who has this great knowledge of math and science and um, is very, you know, she's a very hard worker. She's very diligent and organized. And so all of these factors play into how she's able to execute her abstract work, I think. And um, the way she's extensively able to document it and keep it organized, um, almost so that, you know, this retrospective show that she just had at the Guggenheim um, from 2018 to 2019, it's almost like she did some of the work for them because she had everything so organized so well and everything was so documented. It's um, sort of incredible that they... It's because it's interesting to me because she's very concerned with her legacy and she doesn't have, want any of her work shown until after 20 years after she's dead because even during her whole lifetime while she's working on these pieces, um, you know, she's not showing them to people. And shortly after 1910, you know, Wassily Kandinsky is showing his work and that's sort of when people claim abstraction begun and that's when the abstract expressionist and modernist art movement, like, began. And she even sees some of this works and she has some of her landscape paintings in a gallery at the same time that Kandinsky has abstract work. And it's interesting because in this way we know that she was able to see the other artists were working abstractly, which of course she knew. She was very culturally and socially aware of what was going on around her, but she chose to keep her own artwork like this secret. So that in itself is very interesting to me and she remains this very She's not a recluse, and she's not antisocial, and she's not a hermit. I think a lot of that is just a stereotype that people like to place on her, sort of to assimilate her to the classic male artist reclusive genius archetype, and I don't think that's how she wanted to be remembered or who she was. I think, you know, people also say she was, you know, ahead of her time, and she was so radical for her time. And it's true, she was very radical for her time, and she had a lot of ideas, and all of her journals are, you know, written in Swedish, and they're still being translated today, and um, there are people working on that, so I'm very intrigued to see when those get publicized, um, because she has over 26,000 journal pages of notes and writings about her experiences as a metaphysical medium and contact with the spirit realm. She writes about these entities that she's contacting, they all have names, and um, her own understanding and sort of theories and ideas about the universe and the alchemy of all the things and how everything is connected, and so I think What's important and what I'm sort of trying to understand by understanding her as a person, to the best of my ability, I mean, because she died in 1944, there's no way we can really know everything about her. But I think that's kind of the point, and I think that's kind of what she wanted. So I'm going to respect that. I'm not going to try to make any very bold assumptions, because there is actually a theory that she was queer, because there was an absence of romance in her life that was at least documented. And I'm not going to assume just because there was an absence of men in her life means that she liked women, but... Um, you know, she was able to keep 1,200 paintings and over 26,000 journal pages secret her whole life. Who knows what else? We don't know about her. And, you know, there is a theory that when you're part of a marginalized group, such as, you know, not being a straight person, you're able to understand things about the universe and see connections and understand how human beings exist amongst each other in ways that, you know, straight people would not be able to understand. And so... I would like to explore this idea because there are multiple articles published by people who um, believe that a lot of her understanding of things is connected to um, how she existed in a very unique way. And especially for her time, that sort of lends to her n not, not believing the world was ready to see her work. And not only maybe was the world not ready to see her work, maybe the world wasn't ready for who she was as a person. Because at this time, to be openly queer would be absolutely not... I mean, you could die, you would probably be killed or be serving prison time. So I think her saying the world was not ready for her work is also her saying that the world was not ready for who she was. And I think this is why she kept her abstract work and practice very secret. It's like she was living a double life. Um, there is documentation that people say that while she was alive, she was just a very petite woman with blue eyes and she tended to wear all black. And I think this is very interesting in itself. I mean, 
Um, you know, I guess I'm very interested in sort of studying specific pieces of work by her and understanding how we can see her personality through her work and how dimensional she was as a person and a human being and how it's important to not just see her as an artist, but maybe utmost of utmost importance is to see her as a visionary and almost a philosopher who happened to express her ideas um, majority through visual work. And so just because, you know, unlike Rudolf Steiner, who's publishing all these books about theosophy and philosophy at this time, she chose as her medium of to publish work and create work and express her ideas was through painting. And so I think I'm going to be focusing on the 10 largest paintings, as well as her three altarpiece series. And I'm going to be sort of taking an analytical approach um, and basing, not looking at it from an art, art historical perspective or a technical skill, but sort of analyzing how um, her as the unique individual that she was is so multifaceted and that she's so multidimensional and that we will never really understand completely who she was or what she was about or what her work means. There's no way we'll be able to ever really translate it, but I'm going to try to do my best to do so from my own perspective based on who I am as an artist and a person and the interests that I have and, um, to try to see, you know, to the best of my ability, um, who Hilma of Clint was through some of these select works. So I think for my final product, I'll be writing a short essay, um, emphasizing the importance that we don't just see her as a painter, but that she was a scientist and a mathematician and a visionary and a philosopher and, um, all of these different things. And that, that's, that in itself is so important when we understand her relationship to the art history canon, especially the abstract modernist, and that um, I'm just very interested in her relationship with time and her sort of desire to keep much of her work secret. And, you know, she dies in 1944, and some of her pieces are shown throughout the 80s and 90s, but not until 2018 in New York City at the Guggenheim does she really full-fledged enter the art history canon, and then what does that mean for her? Um, is that what she wanted? Based on my understanding of her, I'm going to be exploring, is that really what she wanted? How did she want to be seen? How did she want her work to be seen? And so I'll be writing a short essay about that, and then I think I'm going to maybe create some piece of work, um, maybe mixed media or um, sort of journal style where there's images and text that point to sort of certain parts within some of her work and not just analyze it from an art history perspective, but like I said, um, connected to her personality and who she was as a person. Yeah.